Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Megan Barrett, and I am the director here at the Iowa Quilt Museum located in Winterset. Winterset is a town of about 5,000, and we're located just southwest of Des Moines in the county of Madison, Madison County. And you may re um, recognize that as the bridges of Madison County. Yes, that's us. Um, we are the home of those bridges that were um, kind of immortalized by the book, movie, and subsequent musical. Winterset is also the birthplace of the actor John Wayne, and there's a museum here dedicated to that. And for the past five years, it is also the home of the Iowa Quilt Museum, and for that we are grateful. So this is our Tuesday program called Virtual Iowa Quiltscape. And we alternate these programs between talking about um, whatever exhibit we have currently on display and talking about Iowa quilters and quilty places um, here in our fine state. Today we are joined by Pam Weeks and she is the Binney family curator at the New England Quilt Museum in Lowell, Massachusetts. And she also has served as the curator for our current exhibit which is called a quilted garden. And you can see behind me this fantastic red and green example of a um, applique quilt. This is called crossed tulips. And then this really interesting quilt over here on my left that we will talk about a little bit later. So without further ado, let's hear from Pam because you came here to see her, not me. Um, before we talk specifically about the exhibit, Pam, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and um, where quilting has taken you in your life and your career? Oh, I'd be happy to. I, like many people my age, late 60s, started quilting at the time of the bicentennial in 1975-76. And those of us who were interested in arts and crafts might have picked up macrame, we might have picked up quilting, which I did. And I've quilted off and on for that length of time. Um, I taught quilting early on. Um, I took classes from some art quilters and was designing my own work. But in the early 1990s, I fell in love with antique quilts. And because I couldn't afford to purchase them at the time, I got interested in learning how to reproduce them. And that took me down a path where I needed to learn about textile history and how my favorite is uh, our printed textiles, printed cottons from the 19th century. So I got into dye history and printing history, which led me to start collecting. And I eventually um, fell deeply in love with signature quilts, inscribed quilts. And uh, because I'm the 10th generation in my family to live in New Hampshire, I have a whole lot of great grandmothers and great great grandmothers and on and on. And I figured if I loved signature quilts somewhere out there, there'd be one that might have a great grandmother's name on it. So I went to an auction and bought an unusually constructed quilt, which we now call potholder quilts made block by block like the one behind me. And that's when I really became a quilt historian. I was involved for a while in the New Hampshire Quilt Documentation Project um, with Lori Chase, a wonderful mentor. I wrote, um, co-wrote an article peer reviewed with her on a New Hampshire signature quilt. And um, I've been the curator of the New England Quilt Museum for the last um, 10 or 11 years. So I guess that's it in a smallest nutshell that I could create for you, Megan. <laughs> Lovely. So as a curator, um, what does that mean exactly? What kinds of things are you responsible for at the New England Quilt Museum? The role of curator changes from um, facility to facility. I feel that my primary role as curator is to organize exhibits and to explain exhibits or to and to present exhibits um, whether it's what we currently have in our smaller genre gallery which is an ex um, a beautiful example of what modern quilts are and explains the modern quilt movement to the um, the quilts in our permanent collection gallery which are featuring yellow and orange um, colors from an art quilt from the 1990s to a, a gorgeous um, 
quilt from about 1840 or 50, which has pink applique cutwork blocks and just amazing orange sashing. And what she was thinking, putting orange and pink together, nobody's really sure. Um, but it's explaining, it's explaining the world through material culture is what I, what I try to do as my job as curator. We're very lucky in that we have a, a wonderful experienced staff member named Laura Lane, who's been um, with the museum for many years and she knows the collection better than I do. And um, I think she keeps the collection in her head because I can ask her a question and within a couple of seconds, she'll have an answer for me. And so that differs, just kind of an aside, that differs from my role here at our quote museum. Um, and I uh, often explain to people that the reason we work with guest curators is because my job is far more managerial. Mm -hmm. We have nobody on our staff here at the Iowa Quilt Museum who plays Pam's role, nor do we have anybody who plays Laura's role because we don't have a collection of our own. And so we're very grateful to institutions like the New England Quilt Museum and knowledgeable persons such as them who are willing to share their expertise and their time with us in putting together exhibits like this. So before we go too much further, um, you mentioned signature quilts and you were thinking perhaps you would someday run across one with your ancestor's name on it. Did you ever? Well, I did. Um, it turns out that there are two in my aunt's possessions. But the one that I thought had my ancestor's name on it, Sarah A. Levitt, uh, turned out to be a potholder quilt. And um, my ancestress was Sarah Lowell Levitt. Oh. But, but that quilt is really what turned me into a serious quilt historian. So I've kind of adopted her. <laughs> Relation by choice, yeah. yeah. And I saw the second comment, Megan, is that to talk about the quilt behind me. Right. So I talked about potholder quilts. I, I threw out the term. A potholder quilt is made block by block in which every block is individually finished. And I began collecting um, samplers from the 1920s to the 1950s and 70s, actually. And they were many were framed. Many were just picked up at yard sales finished but unframed. So I decided to make them into a potholder quilt. And every block is individually bound. And I chose to use fabrics from the 1960s and 70s. The backs are all use, uh, using different fabrics, but it's kind of a fun way to put a project together when you don't quite know what it's gonna turn out to be. So it's kind of early stages of that quilt as you go concept. And everybody thinks that Georgia Bone Steel invented quilt as you go. <laughs> But the earliest one that I've documented is dated 1837 from Boston. Well, and that's so often true that the person who gets credited with something is really the first person who widely marketed it um, and made it kind of a household name, not necessarily the person who invented the technique or, or even the item. And I'm grinning because she's a brilliant marketer. Yes, yes. All right, so let's kind of circle back to the idea of curation. Um, and I love the, the phrase you said is kind of telling the history through material. Um, so I have you talk a little bit about this particular exhibit and you provided for us our really wonderful curator statement, which people can find on our website um, on the page dedicated to this exhibit. But tell us a little bit about how you selected this particular collection of quilts and and what was the history or the story you were trying to tell through that? Well, <clears throat> the big story was about flowers and, and floral influence and design. And um, the quick and easy answer was to send you every floral applique quilt from our collection. I think I sent you, what, six or seven. But then I got to thinking <clears throat> deeply about it. And I thought it would be important that I send to Iowa, <clears throat> pardon me, quilts that you might not see in Iowa that are uh, New England regional styles <clears throat> and a bit older than might have been made in Iowa. Not that anyone who emigrated to Iowa didn't bring some of their New England or their Eastern stuff with them. Mm -hmm. um, so I tried to find um, in our collection and, and then the second, the first layer, Megan, is what we would let leave the museum. Yeah. So you're seeing a few of our, what I would consider our best quilts, but not the truly best quilts from the, from the collection. 
Um, so then I also thought about dates. What are some of the earliest quilts that might show some sort of floral motif, whether it be the quilting or early fabrics? And then how can I represent the different fads that we've been enjoying over the, over the centuries concerning floor, flowers? So um, how are we gonna do this? You said you took pictures of some of the quilts. Yep. And um, I'm trying to figure out, should, will you share your screen and throw, throw images up? Is that how it will work? I can do that and I can throw up, I can <laughs> throw up. I can put up an image and then you can talk about it or you can tell me which image it is that you would like to see and I can put that up as well. All right, why don't we start with the uh, wool whole cloth, the indigo. The indigo, okay, give me just one second. Um, while I'm getting this ready, I might just comment that I knew that this exhibit would be pretty heavy on um, applique, obviously, and I figured there would be some pieced flowers as well. Um, but what I didn't kind of anticipate is the, the other layers of kind of floral inclusion, which include floral motifs in the quilting, um, and then in the fabrics as well. Um, so we have really great examples of all of those things. Um, and then the, the one crazy quilt, the, the floral inclusion is all in the, uh, the embroidery. The embroidery. Yeah. Oh dear, what can you matter? <laughs> so I give a talk um, to quilt guilds and so forth about floral design and quilts. And I actually start by saying that as long as there have been flowers and as long as we have needed as humans to decorate our bodies and our surroundings, we've used floral motifs. Um, the Egyptians have the earliest recorded floral images in their frescoes and um, their tomb decoration. Um, the, you see them in Roman mosaics. You see them all over the place. And um, it just goes, I mean, you can take your finger and put it in mud and make a six petal flower on your cheek with a different color mud in the middle and you've got a flower. So it's been going on forever. Okay, I'm, oh, there we go. I was just about to say I'm all of a sudden experiencing technical difficulties and we're gonna have to go to plan B. <laughs> but I think I've gotten through it. <clears throat> I also have to apologize. My um, seasonal allergies have hit me with vengeance in the last 24 hours. And so I'm Mine too. trying not to sneeze right on the camera. <laughs> and I'm trying to keep my throat clear. <clears throat> Tough time of year, let me tell you. All right, indigo whole cloth. Would you like me to give you some background while you're looking for the image? Yeah, why didn't you do that? I've got the image, it's just not wanting to open. So I'm trying something else real quick. All Go right. Ahead. Background on this one. So there's a um, there so much quilt history has been updated in the past 30 or 40 years and in the colonial revival we heard all kinds of myths and fables about our earliest quilts being patchwork quilts made of necessity when in reality the first quilts that are recorded in inventories <clears throat> in New England which I'm most familiar with are whole cloth and they were luxury items um, the earliest whole cloth quilts, I believe, turn up in Massachusetts inventories in the late 1600s and early 1700s. They were imported from Europe and they were made of silk or cotton or wool. And the wool whole cloths, which were very popular in the Northeast, were generally made, um, the fine imported ones were made of, there it is, were made of wool and if they were finely finished, they were treated with heat and perhaps starch was added to um, make the wool shine because silk was the most popular shiny expensive thing and both cotton and wool could be treated to look a little bit like silk and increase the shine. Now what's not showing up in our picture and I don't have any close-ups either, 
the, um, mo the, the whole cloth quilts are generally quilted with um, trailing feathers or floral designs. And this one has uh, some flowers quilted into it. It was made by Lydia Chase Haskell about 1825 in Newbury, Maine. And what's interesting about the, the wool whole cloth quilts in our collection is we have provenance for a lot of them. Um, Laura and I were talking about this the other day and I got thinking about it deeper. Many of the wool whole cloth quilts and many of the older quilts come with a family legend that the wool was harvested on the farm and dyed and, and carded and spun and woven by the maker. Um, that probably isn't true for a lot of them, but I think because of the, the charming family fable uh, or the story that passed with it, the, the quilts were treasured and saved. Um, wool quilts hit their popularity in the end of the 1700s and into the early 1800s, but they continued to be popular and produced in New England into the 1850s. Um, Wool was superseded by cotton eventually, which was easier to care for, but the large indigo quilts, the large wool quilts, especially the darker colors, um, didn't show their dirt. So I'm gonna see if I can pop up on my phone <clears throat> and then I'm actually gonna take us up and see if I can get a better close up of the quilts as well. Now you see two of me, probably. We don't have a lot of information on Lydia Chase Haskell. We know that she um, made the quilt in about 1825. She was born in eight, 1775 and died in 1863. And Newbury is, I believe, in central Maine. Oh, look at you go. It's on the bed. So, right, so we use this one on our bed turning display, except this time it's not turning, it's just a bed static display. So here you can see the back side of the quilt. This is the most common color combination um, for, a, for a, a whole cloth quilt. There were, they appeared in blue, in paler blue, um, they appeared in green. There are some brilliant red um, dyed with cochineal probably or madder. Um, but the, the yellow on the back, um, I was doing some background reading to prepare for today and many quilt historians feel that it's very likely that the tops of some of the more elegant whole, wool, wool, whole cloth wool quilts might have been made from imported materials. And if there's a family story of it being homespun, it's more likely the back. Um, the back on many of these have a little bit uh, less tight weave and that gold um, is probably a home dye. So were you able to see a little bit closer up on the... Uh... Yes, especially when you, when you pick a place and hold the camera still. Okay. Well, let me pick this place and hold still for a minute. Yeah, so we've got some lovely feathered, um, feathered, feathered areas around some very interesting motifs. I'm remembering now that there are some... Um, serpentine lines of feathering and they almost look like bouti the the paisley like motifs and it looks there's the heart in the center we do not have evidence that this was her wedding quilt but it might have been if it was made uh, oh no 30 years after her birth megan you're going to note that we are not seeing your photo not seeing your phone feed Um, I switched to the view of all uh, the gallery view and it showed up in one of the squares. Okay. Yeah, I've got it in the square. I'll hold still for just a little bit longer if people want to switch to gallery view. Yeah, Kathy's saying that everyone should switch to gallery view and you'll be able to see Megan's phone. Nice job displaying it, Megan. That's perfect. So people can get up close to it and see the motifs. The size on this quilt is 88 by 94 inches.
And so it fits nicely on this um, full size bed, I guess, mm -hmm. antique ish bed that's probably non standard. <laughs> Works for me. Okay, I'm gonna hustle back down to my computer. Now I'll also take a second, oh, sorry. Technology is wonderful. Can be, it can be infuriating too. I'll take a minute to uh, note that um, today our goal is to hear the stories and see the quilts just a little bit. If pe folks want to get in a really up close and personal view with the quilts, we are putting together a um, virtual gallery walk. And so what we do is we take our high resolution photo of those and we um, speak the narration that comes that Pam has provided to us as far as the exhibit signage. Um, and then we zoom in. So, so that's a much better way to actually get an up close and personal view of the quilts. And what we do is we sell that for the same price as admission would be to the museum, which is $6. I'm working on that right now, but since I am the only person on staff here, it's my project and it's not done yet. So I'm shooting for next week. Um, so I will be sure to let people know when that's available. If you're not, um, if you're not on our email list to receive notifications of things like that, I'll let you know how you can do that, but you can just sign up on our website, which is iowaquiltmuseum.org. Okay. So that was our indigo wool whole cloth. What shall we look at next? Well, I was gonna go to the um, indigo pieced Irish chain, okay. if that's easy for you, or do you wanna take a break from your um, endeavors and talk about the quilt behind you? Um, I've got the Irish chain up or- Oh, good. One, your choice. Let's do the Irish chain. All right, there we go. Awesome. So we were gifted, um, oh golly, Laura, I've forgotten, is it seven or nine quilts from the same family? Um, Multi-generational family. Um, this woman was Thankful Hall Miller and we received quilts made by her daughter, Birdsey, and um, other members of the family uh, over four generations, including a male quilt maker. But this is the earliest one. Uh, it was made by Thankful Hall Miller. Um, it's an eight inch single Irish chain block and it's set with alternate plain blocks that are beautifully quilted with a floral motif. Um, now, Megan, when you're ready, if you wanna to try to get really complicated, I do have some close-ups of this quilt. Okay. What's interesting about it is they're floral sprigs um, and they're the same from block to blocks. So um, the thinking of a quilt historian named Sue Wright who identified the quilt and wrote about it is that it might've been a quilting stencil. Um, what's interesting to me as well is the backing is made from homespun fabrics and that's been pretty well proven, but they were probably at one time sheets. Um, and there are, the evidence of that is that there are initials with inventory numbers embroidered on two of the sheets and they're of a little bit differing quality. Um, it was common in the uh, 18th and 19th century to have multiple sets of sheets and to put your initials on them with an inventory number so that you could properly rotate them in the family use. And having your initials on them also protected your stuff if your son married and your daughter-in-law moved into the household with her stuff. Um, so it was a way to keep track of, of what belonged to you. Now, Sue also told us that this is a pretty typical Connecticut quilt. And I think we're dating it um, circa 1820. Um, the Miller family was prominent in their part of Connecticut, descended from um, Revolutionary War soldiers, and continued to be, um, to be prominent in the town through a couple of generations. The fun part was finding out um, that they were donated by um, 
John Reese, Jack Reese. And when I, when, the first time these came out, when I was curator, I plug everything into Google. <clears throat> and to my surprise, another quilt popped up with Thankful Home Miller's name on it. And it's a, uh, another wool quilt, but it's uh, pieced in the snowball pattern. And when I tracked it down, I learned that John Reese had a sister who was still alive. And she didn't know that Jack had half the, or she knew that Jack had half the family quilts, but didn't know that he had donated them to us. And when I met her, she said with some regret, she wished she'd known that because we would have gotten her nine quilts. But what popped up on Google was one of the ones that she had sold to a dealer. And we very rarely purchase quilts for our collection. We rely on the, the beneficence of donors, but we did uh, purchase that quilt so that we now have 10 quilts from the same family. So Pam, now, you can screen share now. I will stop mine. All righty, I've actually... Come on now, just open. And if I move you over and share screen. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. That is the, the um, hand woven backing. And you can see the initials TH. She's thankful Hall Miller. And this is sheet number two. And I threw in the ruler so you could see that we've only got about um, 40 threads to the inch, which show us that it is a homespun fabric. All right, let me ditch this one and pick up the quilting because I was careful to pick up a quilting block, a quilted block. And this shows the motif, um, the floral motif that's that's uh, quilted in each of the white blocks. Can you see that clearly? I can. Everybody else see it? Just curious. Yes. Good. So that motif is repeated across the, um, across the quilt. The, the indigo fabric that you can see is the same in all of the blocks, <clears throat> but it's different in the, um, in the triangle, um, half square triangle border. All right. And then I have one more, which is kind of fun to see. Thankful Hall Miller and her daughters and granddaughters labeled everything. And all of the quilts or the majority of the quilts in the collection came with some kind of label on them. So Alina Brad Birdsey Porter was Thankful Hall's granddaughter or great granddaughter. And this is the, um, the story of the quilt when she gave it to her son, John. In 1957, it was over 135 years old, blue and white bed quilt with homespun back, spun and quilted by Thankful Hall Miller. Sorry, I thought I shut that off. That's lovely. And I'll take this moment to reiterate what I say often, often is label your quilts, people. Because exactly. Cool that we know the story of this quilt because somebody took the time to write it down. Even though it was already 135 years old when she wrote it down, we still know something. And so as quilt yep. makers now, um, don't, don't shortchange yourself in thinking that nobody will want to know who made your quilts or that they will last 135 years. So get those labels on before you gift them away. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what shall we go to next, Pam? I want to see the quilt behind you. Okay. So um, one of the parts about New England history that I love the most and, and talking about women's history as well is how the Industrial Revolution changed our lives and changed quilt history. Um, I was, again, reviewing some stuff over the week to prepare for today. The cost of good calico in the 1780s and 1790s was a dollar or more per yard. And when the average male was earning less than a dollar per week, that was expensive stuff. Within 40 years, um, cotton was being printed by the millions of yards per year. And the price of printed cottons went down to pennies per yard. 
the um, this quilt is a wonderful example of that of that abundance of fabric because it it crosses it tells two stories. It, the center with the um, the double four patch patchwork that goes across the, the middle of the quilt is a great example of someone who had a deep scrap bag. But the drops, and it, this is another example of a, a New England regional quilt, we call them T quilts. Those corners are cut out to accommodate the foot posts of a four poster bed. And this is a fabric that is quite common. It's been documented in several places. Um, we don't know whether she did recycle this perhaps from bed hangings or if she purchased the fabric for those big drops but it's a, a wonderful dictionary of fabrics from the first half of the 19th century. And I believe that red cartouche fabric dates to about um, 1835, 1840. So it's a, a great example. And I sent it because the, um, there are flowers in almost every one of the fabrics. And it's just a great, as I said, a great dictionary of, of early, early textiles. Yeah, for those of you who are really, um, who appreciate or love to examine those early <clears throat> fabrics, this one is really, really cool. I'll try to zoom in on some of these smaller fabrics pieces. Here's a block up here that I think reutilizes the, you know? The drop fabric, yeah. That is the same there. And I think, Megan, you've picked one out that's actually pieced of smaller bits. Oh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so too. Which happens in several places in those in those uh, setting blocks, especially. Right. Yes. Yeah. When we pulled this one out and and put it up to photograph it, um, we commented that it kind of looks like a giant kimono, which <laughs> is a strange aside. That's because you're used to seeing who's who's the quilt artist who who makes quilts in the shapes of kimonos. I'm terrible with names these days. I can't think of anyone's names. Um, and I'm. Uh, familiar with as many names as you are. Someone will pop up with it in a minute. <laughs> All right, where shall we go next? I was thinking about the Central Medallion Brodery Purse. Okay. I will work on pulling that one up. Megan and I had loose plans to keep to the earliest quilts today. Central Medallion. Here we are. Oh, I just remembered the quilt maker's name. Someone said Yvonne Porcella, and that's not who I was thinking of. It's, um, I believe it's Judith Content. So this is a Maryland quilt and it came to our collection um, because the donor I think was living in Massachusetts. And it's a typical of um, another fad, although this is kind of a, Oh, he's saying it's a, a middle class or a poor girl's version is not quite accurate. But what um, is the proper term is, is cut chintz applique. The, the pheasant motifs in the center are cut from a chintz fabric, which would have been quite expensive at the time. And the best bits of the, of the chintz are appliqued onto a white ground. But she didn't use very much of it. Um, if you're interested in it, some folks in the American Quilt Study Group have been tracking the different kinds of chintzes that were used in these quilts. Uh, Mary Kay Valvogel and Barbara Brackman in particular, but the American Quilt Study Group um, uncoverings has, there have been um, several papers in the last few years um, published with cut work chintz applique. And uh, what's interesting to me about it is that she did use the same fabric in the, the patchwork blocks around it. Um, it was started by Emily Jane Hood, who was born in 1830 and died in 1869 and finished by her daughter, Anna Cora Walker um, from Baltimore. It's hand pieced, hand appliqued and hand quilted. Um, the pheasant on flowers textile 
we actually have a quilt in our collection, which I didn't think to, to, to bring an image of. The pheasant fabric is, is um, a very popular one. It was probably dumped on the American market after the War of 1812 because we see it a lot and we see it in many colorways. Um, and we have another quilt that has the pheasant fabric in it as well. Um, and Megan, if you allow me, I do have three close up shots of this one as well. Go ahead, I will stop sharing and you go right ahead. Here's the pheasant. Come on. Clicking, not working. My turn. Thank you. Are you seeing it? Um, yes. Let's see if I can make it bigger. There we go. The pheasant is very carefully clipped out of the um, of the background fabric. And you can see the red thing that comes up into the pheasant's chest. If we were seeing in the entire motif, the pheasant would have quite an elaborate palm tree above its head or fern tree. Um, and those are some of the, um, the, the flowers that are in the, in the print. Now I'm gonna stop my share and go grab another one because I took a couple of real close ups so you could see how well how good her needlework wasn't. Whoops. Can you see that or I, I missed the screen share? No, we don't see anything yet. All right, I gotta get back here. We think we'd all be experts at Zoom now. Oh, there we go. So this is, it shows the quilting and it shows how you can take a piece of chintz and slice it into tiny bits so you get the pattern that you want. Um, I think it's sideways. I think we're looking at the pheasant's belly up in the upper left-hand corner. That would be the, <clears throat> the trunk of the palm tree that's going right to left. But then she took other bits of the chintz to connect that bottom of that pine tree to the floral motif. Um, I've seen finer work in the applique, but this is a big close-up. So um, you're seeing probably and I think I've got one more worth looking at. Yep. I expected anybody to display her quilt quite like we just did. <laughs> Thank you. And this is the, um, the second fabric that's used um, in the cutout and it's also used in the patchwork. So quilters didn't mind using the different chintzes and blending them all together in the same quilt. Her quilting looks a little bit better here. I'll stop being critical. All right. Any questions about that beauty? I don't see anything in the chat. Um, is the background turned under or the chintz? The chintz is turned under. So it's not, it's a traditional applique, not a reverse applique. You choose, Megan. Oh, goodness. Uh, well, that... uh, but before we leave, someone's asking about the term. So brodery purse is a term for cut work chintz applique that we don't see uh, written um, or really referred to until the 1880s or the 1890s, I believe, um, if I've got that date right, end of the 19th century, but most commonly used now is brodery purse, which means Persian embroidery and doesn't really have anything to do with cut work applique. So what if we go next into kind of our red and green section? Shall we do that? We can. Okay. I'm gonna see if I can pull up all five of them somewhat simultaneously to save us a little bit of transition time going forward. Sometimes this works great, sometimes not. Our fingers are crossed. Yeah, you and me both. The majority of our, I can't say the majority, many of our best applique quilts came as gifts from the Binney family. Um, Edwin and Gail uh, Binney Stern, his daughter, were avid collectors and um, gave us the core of the best of our collection. Sadly, the majority of the quilts that they donated do not have provenance. 
So I'm not going to be able to tell you any great detail about most of them. I'm also going to put in the Virginia and Kentucky sampler. Oh, that one. I think I have some, let me look. I think I have some detailed shots of that. Let's, let's do that one first and then we'll go into the red and greens. Okay. So this is an interesting story. This is a binny quilt. It came with enough provenance to know that it either came from Kentucky or Virginia. And um, do you have the label content there, Megan? I didn't bring this one home. Um, I can have. Oh, Mrs. Cottrell, that's the name I'm looking for. I just yeah. remembered it, Mrs. Cottrell. So the, um, the information that is in the file about this quilt is the, the person, um, and I don't know who it was, who was curator at the time, was very curious about the different styles. Uh, sampler quilts were very popular for many years as inscribed quilts, but this quilt has no inscription on it. And the person who wrote the original label for this quilt was curious as to why there were so many different styles in the sampler. Uh, and I think she specifically said, what is the single Irish chain doing in this quilt? <laughs> um, who knows, but it's a wonderful quilt that shows several different styles of patchwork and applique as well as patchwork flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, two different lily patterns and that wonderful sort of folk art rose in the center with its angular stems and, and pointy leaves. And again, another a nice dictionary of fabrics from uh, mid-century. I think it's circa 1860, 1870. And I did take a couple close-ups. I can get over to my files here. Um, This is one of the blocks that shows the fine quilting and the interesting use of, of cheddar with red and green um, and nice mid-century prints in the, um, the economy blocks around the outside border of that block. The whole thing is pretty much quilted in the, um, the parallel line quilting and the quilting is very fine as is the needlework. And let me just go quickly through and see which other ones might be of interest to look at. I'm a big fan of double pinks, so I love quilts like this. Well, I'll show you the detail of the double pink flower centers. How's that? Two double pinks for you. Oh yeah, and two layers of applique, three layers of applique. Exactly with bright yellow centers and just kind of very angular, mm -hmm. <clears throat> very angular applique, a nice mid-century green. I don't think I have any others real good close-ups. No, nope. all set. All right, so I'll go back to my screen share and we'll go into red and green area now. There. This one is one with no provenance, but it's one of the iconic quilts in our um, collection. And if I can facetiously say without Laura hitting me the next time she sees me, I'm, a, I'm amazed she let me send this one to you. It's just a gorgeous quilt. Um, that serpentine feather border is just so high end and the I don't have a close up of this one, but the applique on the, the windblown tulips is just gorgeous. <clears throat> and our executive director likes to joke about this quilt. She said, if it's ever found missing, you know whose home it's in. It's her, <laughs> it's her favorite quilt. Well, and we it's so striking and um, especially so from a distance, it's mm -hmm. on the, what we call the curtain wall that separates yes. the gift shop from the gallery. Mm -hmm. yep. And you can see from a distance, um, it even reads really well from a distance, mm -hmm. even though you can't see the tulips as closely now, but it's, it's a very, very handsome quilt. It is. 
It is so many, so many tulip quilts were made. <clears throat> that one um, is Barb Garrett with us today. That one reminds me of, of Pennsylvania fractor painting, um, but somebody needs to do the research and, and find similar patterns in that genre of craft work because that's what it rem reminds me of most. It is the same style tulip. It is Barb? Same style tulip, yes. Yep. And what sort of work would that have been used in? Uh, furniture, painted furniture, um, quilts, floor coverings. What about the birth announcements that were, what are the, the fracture? Well, it would have been in the birth, the fracture birth announcements. Yeah. So do you think we could call this a Pennsylvania quilt? I would call it a mid-Atlantic at least, somewhere right. Pennsylvania, Upper Maryland. And I think we have the date listed as circa 1860. Yeah. Is that a border that you frequently see, Barb? Uh, in Maryland, not in Pennsylvania as much. Right. That's why I'm putting it like Baltimore to Harrisburg. <laughs> <laughs> no more specific than that? <laughs> no, that's the region. That works for me. <laughs> yeah, um, there were a lot of Germans in that upper part of Maryland, so that tulip could migrate to that portion of Maryland. Got it. And Megan, can you zone in for a, go in for us one more time? What about the star in the center, Barb? Okay, your eight-pointed star, we see stars in the German artwork all the time. Yeah. That, that block looks German. Thank you. You're welcome. So glad you're here. <laughs> Me too, your quilts are great. <laughs> Thanks. Who's next, Megan? Um. I don't know because I can't get it to go to the next one. <laughs> Just bouncing back and forth. Um, it would be. Oh, it's because I'm. Am I at the end? There we go. Let's do this one. The crossed tulips. It's another mid-century quilt that we don't know a lot about, um, except that it was collected in Lynn, Massachusetts, and the person who collected it finished it. Um, the Prairie Point border is not original to the quilt. If you were able to take a real close look at the, um, the fabrics, you'd see that they were close, as close as she could come to it. Um, so some generalizations that I can make about red and green applique is they were much more elegant and complicated. Just think of the, the windblown tulips that we just saw. And I would describe that as an elegant quilt where I would call this one more uh, folksy, I guess, in general. And it is a generalization. The quilts that we find in New England that are red and green applique are simpler in design and execution than the gorgeous, elegant, multi-bordered quilts, red and green, mid-Atlantic and um, in the Midwest. Um, I'm not remembering a lot more about this quilt from the label information. Laura, can you pipe up? We, have, we know the donor who collected it, where it was collected, but beyond that, I don't think we know a lot. The label says it was found in Lynn, Massachusetts. Exactly. She purchased it. Yeah, exactly. So we don't know who left it in Lynn, Massachusetts for her to find. <laughs> this one is a main quilt, and I think we call it um, main folk art applique. Um, Golly, Megan, I'm feeling badly because I concentrated on the early quilts and didn't bring home the label information for these. How far are you from that label? Not very. I'm never far from any labels. Our gallery is not terribly big. So um, 73 inches by 91 inches, maker unknown, 
circa 1850. And this was the gift of the Bristol Burlington Terryville Quilters Guild in memory of Ruth Glahn. Um, and it must have been given to your collection in 1987, I presume. Yep. Um, we don't know anything about it, do we? Not really. Um, the information you have here is pretty general. Um, and this is a great example of that statement you made earlier in that the New England uh, applique red and green quilts are much more simple than those um, that we sometimes see in the Midwest. Right, but I absolutely, knowing little about it, I absolutely love this quilt. It's just oh, so charming. And I think it's really charming that um, there are various degrees of blossoms on yes. that three-figured flower um, that it's, um, and especially one of them is just a little bud. I just think that it's so cute. I know, Becky's asking, um, are they uh, red and green prints? I'm remembering red and green solids. Um, that is correct. They are solid. All of it is solid, in fact. Yeah. Yep. The and other thing I love about it is the unevenness of the border. Mm -hmm. But she was able to squeeze the, the three the three leaved sprigs here and there. Yeah. And the other thing about it, folks, people will often look at a quilt like that and wonder why the flowers aren't all going in the same direction. Well, imagine that on a bed and those flowers dropping down on each side and most people would approach their bed from the side. So that's why many quilts are arranged in that fashion. Mm -hmm. Although sometimes you'll see the center flower motifs going straight up and down. Sure. Um, Catherine wants you to describe the quilting design. So in the blocks um, where there's flowers, um, it, someone, it somewhat mimics or surrounds the floral yeah. motif. Quilted to pattern. There you go. Thank you for that term. I'll zoom in a little bit, but I don't think you'll be able to see it. Now in the sash in between the blocks, um, there's this cute little four petaled floral um, design. Right, so she's repeating the, the, the petals. Yep. And then there's a feather motif surrounding the serpentine applique border. Got it. Yeah. It's really quite good quilting. The fabric quality itself isn't, um, it's not terribly high quality fabric. Um, I can see the, the weaving in it, um, but the quilting itself is quite nice. Cool. So I think we've got one more red and green. That's the one I was hoping you'd pick. Oh, good. <laughs> this one is titled Princess Feather. Um, and it's also from the Binnie Family Collection, circa 1860. So there's a lot of debate about this pattern name and I'm going to come down hard on the block being inspired by a plant called amaranth. Amaranth, um, you, you might know it as Love Lies Bleeding, Prince's Feather or many other names, but there are several species that have both red and green bracts like that. Um, other quilt historians insist that it's based on the feathers of the Prince of Wales crest. And the reason I'm going to dispute that is because if you follow any of the, um, the British royalty uh, um, symbols, the, the Prince of Wales three feathered crest are white and there are three of them. However, in 1860, the Prince of Wales visited the United States and traveled to many cities. Um, one quilter who kept a diary <laughs> reported going down to Portland, Maine to see his ship come into the harbor. So yes, there's a great deal of, um, of speculation as to where the pattern comes from, but I think it's from the plant amaranth. Anybody wanna argue, Barb, <laughs> Anita? <laughs> And while we're on this quilt, I just love the um, the little pots of tulips in this in this setting. The little pots of tulips. Oh yes, yeah. Because the the big feather or the you know big frond type leaves are so striking that those little pots of tulips can almost get lost. Um, so anybody who wants to doubt me, when we end, Google Princess Feather Amaranth, and you'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> So I'm going to pick up one more red and green quilt that I did not get in my first, first batch. And that's the one called um, 
Uh, quilted pine or uh, applique pineapple. That's an interesting one. Yeah. So let me go. So are they really pineapples? Yeah. Good question. Because um, I had a hard time matching. I, I photographed them without the list sitting in front of me. And then when I had to match up the names to them, I had a hard time deciding if this name matched this quilt. <laughs> exactly. Process of elimination because I didn't have the label right in front of me. So I've given this one a lot of thought as well, and I think we should probably rename it Christmas Cactus. Mm, yeah. Um, we try to, um, is this, a, I'm, not, I'm not remembering the provenance of this one. I think it's, it's zero information again. Um, don't, don't, don't worry, I know I'm right. But um, <clears throat> again, if, if it's a New England quilt, it's simpler in design and um, very interesting pattern, but I, I think we should probably rename it Christmas cactus. What so do we have? This says that a handwritten label once attached to the bottom right corner of this quilt indicates that Susan Gallagher Waugh, who lived uh, oh, in 1830 yep. to 1894, made this quilt in 1816. Um, Susan was born into a Mennonite family in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and married Abraham Waugh, and then they lived um, close to Niagara. And then she's the one who had personal property listed in the in the census. Yes. Personal property in the value of two hundred and fifty dollars. <throat> right. Now I'm remembering that that research was fun. It was so unusual for a woman to have her own property listed. And then they <clears throat> eventually emigrated to the Illinois area. And when you do research on that family, you can find out a whole load more about her daughter, <clears throat> who they raised to be. Um, well-educated and an attorney. And um, what's sad about that quilt is that we can find out buckets about her husband and buckets about her daughter, who was a prominent attorney in Illinois and very little about her beyond her, obviously making sure that her daughter was well-educated. Well, what do you think kids? Shall we rename it Christmas cactus? <laughs> I think so because um, I, I think you're absolutely right. The design of it is very much that mm -hmm. Christmas cactus that comes right out of the, yeah, yeah, I think so. Sure. Randall says yes. Kathy says yes. <laughs> um, let's see if I can describe the quilting design in that one. Um, I'll have to get a little bit closer. And do we know how much the colors have faded? Mm, I very don't. Little. They do have more of a muted um, tone <laughs> to them. The green is actually a green with a very uh, kind of a rusty red polka dot. Mm -hmm. And the red has, it must have had two colors of polka dot in it at one point. The yellow remains and whatever color was there before is completely gone. It's, okay. it's the fabric has disappeared. What, what's our term for that? Um, it's, is it popped out? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. gone. That's right. Now I'm remembering. Anita wants to compromise and call it cactus flower, which I, I'm with. <laughs> so the question on this one, um, there's feathered circles in between um, where the four cacti meet. Uh, there's a really interesting circle motif um, with some lines through it. It's not quilted to design, especially. And then there's some straight line quilting through the cactuses themselves. Uh, it's really quite intricate in its quilting. Mm -hmm. When I make the, the video tour, uh, the virtual gallery tour, I'll see if I can get some close-ups. It's very hard to photograph quilting um, because it takes a certain amount of, of relief between the lights so you can actually see the, the difference there. But I'll, I'll see if I can do that. Um, so Bonnie is asking, what's your opinion on adding a label now to a vintage quilt that doesn't have one? The question has to be asked, what do you know about it? <clears throat> and I would say that I would add a label if it's a quilt that I, and I've done this, if it's a quilt that I've collected, I record where I collected it, what I know about it. Um, and then any, so, so you can, you can at least put the date, you can, put, you can put where you collected it or your, your best guess at a date. Um, and then there's not much else you can do. 
but it doesn't diminish the value at all to carefully add a muslin label. Of course, that could be re removed if somebody wanted to, but that doesn't change the value. Right. Um, in fact, I would say that having at least some provenance will actually yeah. increase value quite a bit. Um, and the other part that just popped into my head, let's say it was once in the collection of Marianne Fawns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be an interesting factoid about that, about that quilt, that, that she loved it enough to, to collect it on her own. The other, the other thing that's in, that may be worth noting, um, and this can be a somewhat sensitive subject, um, and that's, that's the, or the notion that family history that's passed down with a quilt is often inaccurate. Um, and that's, that's not meant as an insult to anybody at all, but oftentimes whatever has been passed down. So, so before you write down what was told to you by an, an older relative, see if you can substantiate any of that, either with another relative or, you know, or at the very least say, this is a story as it was told to me by such and such, you know. And then we're representing it as family history as opposed to hard black and white fact. Right, and Bonnie's added a, a bit to her question. <clears throat> it's a quilt that her grandmother made in the 1930s. So do you know that grandmother's name? And um, if it was made of fabric from your mother and your aunt's clothing, I would include those two names as well. Mm -hmm. And that it's now, you know, in, in 2021, that it's in your possession. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, if you have that much information, absolutely put a label on it. And if you ever have any pictures of that aunt and that mother in those clothing, that's just, that's a priceless addition to be with that quilt. Yeah. Megan, you're speaking to someone from New England. They ha we have aunts here, not aunts. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we drink pop here in the Midwest and we have aunts. <laughs> I love that Geico commercial. <laughs> have you seen it? Um, I don't know that I have. Don't worry about it. I'll, not for today. Well, I'll look it up though, because I, I'm a big fan of Geico commercials. Um, Judith has got her hand raised. So Judith, if you want to unmute yourself and, and turn your, go ahead. We'll hear your question now. No, I'm sorry. I raised my hand because I was voting oh, I with you. <laughs> Will you, accept, it was a hand vote. <laughs> will you accept Anita's suggestion for cactus flower? <laughs> I, I really like Christmas cactus because it's the Christmas colors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. That, that was my vote. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, I know that we did not get to all of the quilts today in the exhibit, and that's somewhat intentional because if we get to them all in one session, we're going really quickly. Um, and I know Janet really wants to know about the blue Hawaiian quilts. But I'm going to have to say I'm sorry, Janet. You're going to have to tune in two weeks from now, um, and we'll see if we can't hit the rest of the quilts in the collection. Um, we have the blue Hawaiian quilt that I just mentioned. We have a few more samplers, um, a couple of really nice album quilts, um, Baltimore album quilts, although they're not from Baltimore, um, and then uh, some other things as well. So two weeks from now, Pam will be back with us, and that is April 13th. Uh, remember that we sign in, we come on board, come online, whatever, every Tuesday at 12. Next week, um, the program is, uh, is TBD, to be announced still. Um, I have had an idea, but I've got to suss it out in the next 48 hours, and then I'll be able to announce that. Uh, but Pam will be back with us. Again, if you're not on our emailing list, um, go to our website scroll down a little bit on the home page and right where it says um, sign up to receive news from the quilt museum or something like that give us your email address i never sell it to anybody else and you only get information from me about once a week but you find out about these programs upcoming events exhibit changes and etc and pam what's the best way for people to collect connect with the new england quilt museum if they want to do such www.nequiltmuseum.org. Easy peasy. And ours is iowaquiltmuseum.org. And both of those are in the chat window now. Um, so thank you 
so much, Pam, for putting together this fantastic exhibit of floral quilts. My great pleasure. Even more for being with us today and sharing your time with us. Um, we look forward to seeing you again in a couple of weeks. And thank you all for signing on and sharing a little time with us on this Tuesday afternoon. We look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks as well. And thanks for your input, folks. Yes, for sure. Have a great afternoon, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.